why don't we introduce ourselves quickly and then I have Alexis take over. Um, so Jonathan, why don't you start? Sure, hi everybody, nice meeting you. Uh, Jonathan London, I am the founder of a company called the Improved Performance Group. We've been working with companies worldwide uh, in developing their sales teams, their leadership teams, both from a process perspective and a skills perspective. Uh, most recently, I have uh, developed a Selling Mindfully workshop. So uh, similar to Alexis, I have a strong practice and belief in mindfulness. And I've created a workshop that very intensely overlays the principles of mindfulness into the actual selling practice and process. So um, you get all the benefits that Alexis will be talking about, plus you get better results and happier clients. So I've uh, known Gerhard for years and uh, I'm delighted to be here with everybody. My name is Jerome Gafford. I'm a professor of marketing at the University of Texas at Dallas. I teach in the professional sales program there. I also have a consulting business I run myself where I work with companies and with individuals on helping them uh, achieve the level of success that they're wanting to achieve in their selling careers. Uh, my motto is uh, healthy selling is happy selling. So I use the vernacular of the sales doctor to diagnose problems that people are having in the selling environment, both individually and with groups. And then through some work we do uh, in research and behaviors and, and fear around prospecting and, and performing the tasks necessary to be successful. Uh, we help companies achieve uh, that growth level they're looking for. I'm excited to be part of this event these next six weeks because a lot of what I talk about with people has to do with the mindset, the, the fixed mindset versus the growth mindset. And I'm anxious to learn more about how we can incorporate these, uh, this program into what we're doing now. David, with Power Speaking, I've been in the sales role for um, four years and now have a small team. And so just looking at how I can improve my own skills and support the rest of the team. There's a lot of noise out right now. So one of the things that I'm talking to the team about is um, rather than 50, uh, what are five or 15? Um, and having really focused, deliberate conversations around uh, how to provide value uh, and maybe outside of the space that we're currently working in. So how do we use our network? Um, not necessarily talking about the transaction, but what are they currently going through and how do we leverage our network and our knowledge to support them through whatever they're going through from a process standpoint or uh, communicating. What I'm hearing is that um, the uncertainty out in the marketplace uh, is affecting people's mindsets. It is. Um, so, th yeah. There's a lot of... Uh, it, it, feels like people are having frag fragmented conversations um, because it seems like everything's, there's so much urgency and there's so much unpredictability. Um, so, yeah. There's too much going on. The brain is in overload and uh, people get anxious and, um, and buyers are reluctant to spend money and um, more decision makers involved, um, and then a lot of last minute surprises. No, we don't have the budget. We had some cuts. Uh, cut, <laughs> uh, we had some layoffs, yeah, right? A few people that just follow on audio, that's fine. So why don't we uh, go back to uh, Alexis and uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and you know share with us uh, how can we become more mindful? Thank you all for spending an hour or two of your day. And thank you, Gerhard, for again inviting me to um, share my passion uh, with the group of salespeople. Uh, for those of you who, uh, I'm not sure if there was a bio or anything sent out before, but my history, uh, I worked at uh, Cisco for over 12 years as a, a sales leader there. And uh, while I was there, took over a business in New York City. So I was running the New York uh, sales and engineering business for Cisco and took over failing business. And for those of you who have you know, been through that before in a corporate role um, can be very difficult, especially when you've got employees and salespeople who are used to stress, but not used to the ma massive uncertainty, just like we're seeing today. We missed a big market transition. And so um, outside of work, I had always uh, been teaching and uh, practicing mindfulness and so I thought, let me bring in this program, see, see what it does for the business. And so we were able to recover the business from 67% of plan to 94%. 
um, had reduced anxiety with folks on my team, um, no turnover, um, people lost weight, people were able to repair their marriages. I mean, the list went on and on of, of all of these good things that it did. And so uh, the organization recognized that, ended up rolling out a program to 40,000 uh, people at Cisco's sales meeting, and then again, globally to 70,000. And um, you know, the, the testament to this is not only in my team performance, but my own experience, because I was a top 1% performer at Cisco, an average of 160% of plan for over a decade in three different markets, um, only working 20 hours a week. And so what I'm going to be going over today is really how the brain, how the body work, um, and how mindfulness can be truly tool for us uh, when we are in these high stress, fast paced, uncertain roles such as sales. And so I'm going to go ahead and start my slide deck here. Okay, so <clears throat> I like to start out with a story here um, just to illustrate kind of what our day to day lives are like. Um, but the net net is I was um, and actually Jonathan, who's on the call here, um, was one of my first sales trainers at Cisco. So this is definitely full circle uh, getting to to be with him on on this call. Um, so I was a baby salesperson. Um, my first QBR with my boss where I was asked to come in and um, show the goals initiatives what I've been driving over the quarter. And during this time, I was working, I mean, 80 hours a week just to get to 98% of plan. So, um, you know, putting in a lot of energy and, and, and just barely getting there. So I come in there with about six different slide decks or six different uh, slides and about 50 different bullet points. And my boss, I thought, was going to applaud me for all the things that I was doing. But instead, he just took a deep breath and sat back in his chair and paused. And when he did talk, he said, look, um, and if you guys can mute yourselves, that would be great. He said, look, I think it would really, really serve you to become an expert on a few things rather than trying to get it all done. And he said, just for context, your peers came in here and had one slide deck and three bullet points. And I left that meeting and I'm like, what is he talking about? This job is so stressful. There are a million things to do. And um, when we look at really this industry as a whole, it has twice the turnover rate than the entire workforce combined. And so there are a lot of things going on here that can impact the sales role and make it very difficult for salespeople to really be able to, to focus, execute, and get their job done in a way that impacts uh, results and their well-being. And we're living in a really, really different time now that we have technology as well, right? who have access to tons of information. They can Google anything on the product or service that we want. And more often than not, when they Google, they've got a ton of other opportunities or organizations that they can choose to partner with. In addition, they expect salespeople to be available 24 seven and have a truly personalized experience. And so when we talk about this sales role, there is a lot going on and juggling. And so telling someone just to focus on one slide with three bullet points becomes very, very difficult, right? And so what do we do? Well, we end up multitasking, right? So I'm on a WebEx or a Zoom call and I'm shooting out an email to a client, or maybe I'm in a client meeting and I just want to check on, you know, what happened uh, during the text messages or my email while I've been in there. And we're trying to get multiple things done at one time. And so in the late 1990s, early 2000s, researchers wanted to understand who are the best multitaskers? How do we hire for them? How do we develop them in our workforce? And how do we identify them early in the process? And so rather than tell you what the researchers found, um, I'm gonna ask you guys to all pull out a pen and paper and we're gonna go through a quick exercise to see who are the best multitaskers. And this is a, uh, an exercise that I've been through. I went through during my own training with multiple different organizations and companies. And it's always interesting to see who are the best multitaskers. So what you're going to do with your, your paper is you're going to write down your name. So your first and your last name on the first line. And then on the second line, you're going to write down your phone number. 
And so these are two pieces of information you should be very, very familiar with, right? Nothing tricky there. And in this first timed exercise, uh, this is gonna serve as the baseline. So we're going to just simply over 20 seconds, alternate writing your name, your phone number, your name, your phone number, your name, your phone number, okay? And we're gonna do that over 20 seconds, excuse me, got the space. And we're gonna see who are the best multitaskers on the call after we do our second test. So I'm gonna go ahead and start my timer here. If you all wanna put your pen to the paper, don't start just yet. And when I say go, again, you're gonna be alternating your name, your phone number, your name, your phone number. So let's get started right now. And you've got five seconds. And lift your pen off your paper. If you wanna go ahead and tally the amount of times you're able to write your name and your phone number, and then circle that at the bottom. Now we're gonna get into the test part. So if you can go ahead and just find another part of your paper, we're going to be this time multitasking. We're gonna simulate what the brain does when I'm going from my email to another email popped up, to a text message, to a phone call just came in, or someone just came to my desk if we're you know, co-working at home and we've got family who needs us to do something. So this is gonna simulate us multitasking. And what we're going to do is we're gonna first start writing the first letter of our name, and then we write the first number of our phone number. Then we write the second letter of our name and the second letter of our phone number. So you're simply this time, rather than writing your full name and then your full phone number and alternating lines, we're going to be alternating in between that task. So letter in the name, number in the phone number, letter in the name, number in the phone number, and we'll be going back and forth, okay? So if you wanna put your pen to paper, I'm going to go ahead and time you starting now. And five seconds. And lifting that pen off the paper. So I see a few smiles here. And usually when I do this in person, people are giggling and chuckling and um, would love to hear from, yeah, uh, uh, anyone on the call here, uh, Jonathan, David, what was that experience the first time versus the second time? Well, I only got to do it one time. <laughs> so and the performance I was made, a bit lower. I made one mistake at the end. Otherwise, it, it went pretty well. Good, good. So performance and some air quality issues. Um, on the second time, anybody else? Anybody else get get through it more, the, faster the second time? Probably not. Uh, did anyone feel super calm the second time? Yeah, probably not. So what you guys experienced um, was what we actually do on a daily basis all the time. And what the researchers found was exactly what you experienced. Um, that multitasking actually isn't the most efficient way of getting our jobs done. And, and in fact, we don't actually multitask. We do something called switch tasking. And every time that we switch tasks, we end up decreasing our productivity by 63 seconds. So every time that I am working on an email and then another email comes in and I move to that, and then I try and move back to that initial email, we're actually losing productivity. And as you found in this exercise, our quality of work goes down, our stress response increases. And I think the part that is most impactful to me is that it isn't just our work, it neurologically changes our brain. And in fact, the more that we multitask, um, the more that we decrease the gray matter in our neocortex. And so I'm gonna explain and introduce the uh, science to you here by illustrating what neuroscientists have coined the triune brain. 
And so we have our neocortex, which is what I just referenced. And this is the outer and the newest part of our brain. And this is where our rational thought and reasoning reside. Um, this is where we take all of those facts, feelings, experiences that we have, and we come to have a really rational, logical response. Um, this is also where our center of focus and concentration reside and emotional regulation. So during our professional day, this is really what we want to be activating the most. The second part of our brain is the limbic system. And the lim limbic system is, you can think of it as kind of the middle part of the brain. And this is the second oldest part of our brain. And this is responsible for where our um, emotions and our feelings reside. And a lot of people don't realize, but most of our actual uh, behaviors and actions stem from our feelings. And so it becomes very important for us to become much more aware and mindful of them because they actually inform an output, right? A reaction. Um, how does this manifest during the workday? You might interview someone who has all the credentials in the world, right? Went to Harvard, um, has, you know, been a top performer where they've worked before. But when you interview them, you kind of have that like, eh, feeling where you don't necessarily trust them or maybe want to work with them and you don't hire them. That's that limbic system at work. And when we look further into it, you know, there's a whole study of behavioral economics and how our actual feelings impact financial decisions and our economy. And so again, that limbic system is very, very important. The third part is our reptilian brain. The reptilian brain is the oldest part of our brain. Think of it kind of like the, the centermost part of the brain. And this is really that, where that fight flight instinct resides and survival. And so what happens when we are, for instance, multitasking or, um, you know, we get an email about a deal that's, that's not going to happen. Um, the body actually activates automatically the survival instinct. And so it turns on that reptilian brain, it activates the reptilian brain. So we're not working in that neocortex anymore. Instead, we are in that reptilian brain and we're in survival mode. And so the reptilian brain tells us to do and think as much as possible to mitigate risk and uncertainty. And so our reps and ourselves, we start multitasking, um, we start creating massive to-do lists, and we start ruminating, right? Where we find ourselves before work, after work, especially when we're trying to fall asleep, thinking about work and how we can get things to a point that feel a bit more stable for us, right? Because that stress response has activated something called the default mode network in the brain. And that tells us, again, think, get out of this situation, you need to survive. The second thing that happens is that we have neurochemicals that flood the body and they reinforce behavior. So many of us have heard cortisol and adrenaline. Those are two different neurochemicals that make us aggressive and competitive, which again are probably not things that we need during the work day unless we're like a boxer or something. Um, and the third one that we get is dopamine. And dopamine is a pleasurable neurotransmitter. And it feels good. And we get a hit of it every time we do something. And so this is when we find ourselves quite literally addicted to checking our phones because every time we check our phone, we get a hit of that dopamine. Um, on average, we check our phones about 150 times a day. Every time we check an email, we get a hit. And so we go back to those to-do lists, right? And we start crossing off the tasks that are low priority, that get done fastest so we can get this hit rather than us focusing on those big strategic moves, right? So rather than um, you know calling a client and having a thoughtful conversation about their long-term goals, we'd probably be more apt to sit in front of email where we can quickly check things off, right? So the third part is around the neural pathways. And what happens is every time that we activate a part of our brain and then we move on to another part, we form a pathway. And very quickly, these pathways can become quite dominant as we start to develop habits. So the more that we multitask or the more that we're in this reptilian brain, the more and deeper those pathways get. 
So if you think about it, it's kind of like when, when you go hiking, you can tell the difference between, um, you know, where a deer path is and then one where there are humans with bikes and animals um, that it's being used quite often, right? And that's how the brain works as well. And so those pathways actually get stronger over time. And so when we are in uh, this, this survival mode, the brain tends to default to whatever is most dominant and easiest to get done. Because again, it's all about ensuring survival. And it doesn't really matter if it's actual threat in front of us or one that's a thought, right? And so that thought being stressed out at work, that can stimulate alone this stress response. And so everything that I've just talked about here sounds pretty doom and gloomy, um, but I want to reassure you it's actually not. Um, there's something called neuroplasticity. And so how we actually created this situation, right, this, this repetitive uh, behavior, these dominant pathways, this dopamine addiction, how we actually created this is actually um, how we can uncreate it. We can create a new situation in our brain because we know that when we do a different exercise to the brain, we're actually almost doing like a bicep curl for the brain. And so um, we need to figure out what is that exercise because we know that multitasking uh, makes a, that reptilian brain stronger, but what can help us make that neocortex stronger, right? That we talked about before, that part of our brain that we really want to be in uh, during the workday. And that's where mindfulness comes in. So mindfulness is simply being focused in the where of the present moment. It's not about relaxation. It's not about falling asleep. It's not a religion. It is simply about being present in the moment. And when I am present in the moment, I'm activating the part of my brain responsible for focus concentration. And that resides in the neocortex. And so when I am present and focusing on one thing, I'm basically doing a bicep curl for the neocortex. By practicing mindfulness, we literally restructure the brain for focus, for concentration, rather than the distracted multitasking that actually doesn't impact our performance very well. And so there are two forms of mindfulness that I work with clients on. And one is teaching um, an actual meditation, um, a single pointed focus concentration practice, which I'll explain what that is. And then we teach an informal practice. And that informal practice is how you actually take mindfulness into your workday and integrate it. So talking through what the first, what the uh, formal mindfulness practice is. Um, so like I just said, it was the sit practice. And so the, during a sit practice, that is where we are focused on the breathing and counting. And when we are just focused on one thing, we can strengthen that neocortex because we're activating the neocortex. We're activating the focus and concentration part of our brain. So before I teach you this, this practice, I just wanna uh, check in. Are there any questions, any feedback? Okay, so we'll go into this. Oh, Gerhard? No? I just wanted to say that Uma joined us. Uma Hamid, hi. Thanks for joining us. All right, continue, Alexis. Okay, wonderful. So uh, we're gonna start with the SIP practice where I will cue you through it and then we'll all do it together. Okay, so um, S is for seat. Simply for this practice, you sit in a seat. There's no crazy yoga pose. Um, you could be in a bus commuting. You could be at your office. You could be at home, whatever, just sitting in a seat. Feet on the floor, shoulders on top of our hips with a flat back. Um, the reason for the flat back two points here. One, we want to make sure that we are focused and alert. We're not falling asleep. We're not super relaxed. We want to make sure, again, because this practice is all about being alert and present in the moment, not falling asleep. We want to make sure that we're in a, a posture that um, helps support that. Second part, we want to make sure that we're able to breathe because this is all about the breath. So that is for a uh, seat. 
for S is for seat, I. I is for inhale and exhale. And in this practice, you're just gonna be inhaling through the nose and exhaling through the nose. And every time that you inhale and exhale, we count that as a set. T, T is for 10. So when you start this practice, you're simply going to use your phone as a timer and set the timer for 10 minutes. From a neurological perspective, they have shown that by practicing this practice for 10 minutes for two weeks starts to show neurological markers for increased focus and concentration. So we wanna basically set this timer and we do that because that way when you get distracted or you start thinking like, how much longer is this? I'm gonna die doing this. You know, all those things that come in, you just tell yourself, look, my phone has the timer. I don't need to think about this anymore. I'm gonna go back to the breath and the counting. The second part of 10 is also how we use those sets of inhales and exhales. So if I told you just to sit here for 10 minutes, inhaling through the nose and exhaling through the nose, I'm pretty sure that most of you on this call would have a to-do list for the next five years. And like, that's not the point. The point here is actually to train the brain on how to focus and concentrate. And so what we're going to do is every time that we exhale, we count one, inhale, exhale two, inhale, exhale three. And then when we get close to 10, we actually reverse the counting back down to one. So it would look like this. Inhale nine, X or exhale nine, inhale, exhale 10, inhale, exhale nine, inhale, exhale eight, inhale. So you're simply just counting up to 10 and then reversing it back to one and then back up to 10 and reverse back down to one. And you're going to do the same thing, this breathing and counting over the course of 10 minutes. And every time you get distracted, it's completely okay. Because every time that you do that, right, you're going to be focusing on the breathing and counting, which is activating the neocortex then you're going to get distracted. Maybe it's with like my back hurts right now. Maybe it's a to-do list. Maybe it's a, oh shoot, I got to email that person later. Some distraction is going to pop in and it's going to activate a different part of the brain. And then you're basically going to strengthen that awareness muscle in the brain that brings your awareness back to the breathing and counting. And so a lot of type A people that I work with get very, I'm not good at this and I failed. No, actually every time that you get distracted and then you bring your mind back to the present moment, you're actually strengthening the brain from a neurological perspective. So don't get discouraged, just let it go, you know, notice it and then come back to the breathing and counting. That's all you have to do for 10 minutes. So any questions before we get started? because we're gonna do this together. Okay, so I'm going to set my timer here and we're gonna go for eight minutes and see how this experience feels. Again, all doing is breathing and counting. As you get distracted, just pull yourself back to the present moment. So I will cue you through this as we set up here. So let's place those feet flat on the floor Shoulders down away from the ears, shoulders on top of your hips. Take an inhale, and on the exhale, closing the eyes. Inhale through the nose, fill the belly, and exhale as you notice and follow the breath through the chest, the throat, the nose, counting to one. Inhale through the nose, Following the breath into the chest, the belly, and exhale two. So you'll keep going like this as you count up to 10 and then back to one. If you get distracted, just come back to one and start the breathing and counting. I will let you know when the time is up. So just let go of that concern and move into the present moment.
Remember that the only place that you have to be right now is right here. As you become distracted, just come back to one and start the breathing and counting. Rather than just going through the motions of counting and breathing, really try over these next two minutes to watch the breath as it moves in and out of the body. Be as present with that breath as you possibly can. And as we start to wrap up our practice, keeping our eyes closed, let's just take a few breaths here, deeper breaths. As we inhale through the nose, deeper breath. And then make that exhale as slow as you possibly can, relaxing the shoulders. When we exhale slowly, we stimulate the vagus nerve, which signals to the body that it's time to relax. 
One more breath here, inhaling deeply through the nose. And this time exhaling slowly through the mouth as we relax the shoulders, the jaw, and the face. And then opening the eyes and coming back into the call. So we'd love to hear feedback, questions. So one, it was relaxing and beautiful. Two, it's the longest eight minutes I've had in the last little while. <laughs> and three, I found myself actually nodding off a little bit and I'd catch myself. And four, just doing that count gave me something to do so my thoughts didn't do anything other than pay attention to the breathing. And the counting really helped actually, surprisingly. I thought it'd be a distraction, but it uh, kind of locked me in. Great, great. Thank you. Jerome, what do you think? I find myself losing count. I was getting too relaxed. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, it's uh, interesting. Uh, and uh, there are, and of course, there's always things going on around us, but I found myself having to pull my focus back in to tune it all out. And, David? Um, so question, uh, is it good to do it like in a quiet space? So you're minimizing the distractions or is part of the practice kind of like within any environment, it's okay to do this or it's advised to do this? And what's, what's the best environment to do this in? Right. So um, yeah, that, that leads me to the, the second part here, uh, which I always get the question or I get the comments questions. When do I do it? where do I do it? And um, I felt dizzy or like I was going to fall asleep. So I'll, I'll kind of address those. Um, the best meditation that you do is the one that you actually do. So if that means that, um, you know, the only time of day that you have available is, um, you know, on your commute or in the office or, you know, your children are like screaming outside of your door. Um, if that is the only time that you have to get it done and can do it, then do it. And that might mean there are some distractions in the background and it might mean that, that it's absolutely quiet. I do recommend when starting um, to have a quiet space where you do feel safe, right? Like, like there isn't this um, unconscious kind of like, oh, someone could steal my stuff right now or, uh, or, or come hurt me in any way. So you wanna make sure that you do have um, a space that does feel safe and, and contained. Um, but again, going back to like the realities of life, the best meditation is the one that you actually do. So if that can be a quiet area, then awesome. If it isn't, then yeah, that's another part of the practice. Um, and then back to uh, the, the uh, comment around feeling a little bit relaxed or sleepy. And yes, that is something that I hear from most of my clients um, that they feel either dizzy with the breathing or like they're going to fall asleep. And again, like I said, this is a concentration practice, a single po pointed practice where we're stimulating the neocortex, which helps us focus and concentrate better. Um, the idea is not sleepiness, but it can happen. And what I've noticed um, is that for a lot of us, we're shallow breathers and we spend all day hunched over our computer. And when we actually take the time to breathe in and out in the beginning of our practice, that can make us very sleepy and it can make us very dizzy. And over time, that starts to go away. Uh, one, because we start to get used to that feeling, but two, throughout the day, we start actually breathing and holding ourselves a little bit differently. And then the third part uh, I get is, you know, when should I be doing this? Uh, again, the best meditation is the one that you actually do. Um, but I do recommend for most of my clients, if you can, to do your practice first 10 minutes of the day before you've checked your email, before you've checked your phone, and where you can just drop in and you don't have all these other conflicting thoughts throughout the day. Um, also, you know, first thing in the morning means that we're less likely to put it off i.e. never do it. <laughs> so being able to get that done first thing in the day tends to be uh, 
very helpful for most people. If not, um, attaching it to a habit that you already do. So maybe it is, I know every day I'm gonna have lunch and I'm gonna meditate. Or after I brush my teeth at night, I'm going to go meditate. If you can attach it to a habit that you already do, it, it becomes a lot easier. Any other questions? Yeah. What about um, everybody going to their calendar right now and uh, entering a, um, a 10 minutes, 10 minute mindfulness break for tomorrow. And you decide when you want to do it. Can we do that? Fair enough. All right, let's go to the iPhone, schedule it and make it happen. Awesome. And there will be homework at the end of this too, which, which includes that. So if you all want to wait and we can do that at the, the end, that's, that's fine as well. Thank you, Gerhard. It's a great suggestion. And yeah. The, one of the tips I've used in the past is just some earplugs. So if you're in a place that's kind of noisy at home, uh, let the kids be the kids and you just put those in and it just hushes everything up. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. Wonderful. So I've just talked about how great mindfulness is. And uh, the caveat, the warning here is that it doesn't prevent shit from happening. Okay. <laughs> what it does help us do is be much more present in the moment. So we can really look at our reactions and make sure that they're much more healthy and productive and impactful in the moment. And um, so what I had realized was, you know, I had my first quarter where uh, I was working like crazy hours. I wasn't very focused. I ramped up my meditation practice. Every morning was doing my mindfulness practice. And, um, you know, about six months later, so we're close to the end of my fiscal year as an AM, um, I was still working crazy hours. I had had strep throat three times over, over the, um, the year. And I realized that while I was practicing mindfully, I wasn't living mindfully. And so what I needed to do was figure out a way, how do I actually incorporate mindfulness into my workday as a crazy sales professional who, who's just trying to get it done? And so uh, I went back to what my boss said, which was your peers came in here with one slide deck and three bullet points. And so I said, every day, I'm going to do my practice and then I'm going to set aside time to think about what are my three high impact activities that I'm going to focus on today. And those are the things that I'm really going to drive towards. I'm not going to get sucked into the email or the text messages or on LinkedIn posting, you know, X, Y, Z about, you know, whatever product I'm really going to focus on what those high impact activities are. And so I'm going to ask you right now to grab that pen and paper and to write out what are your high impact activities for your job for, for just maybe this week just think about what are the real big nuggets that you could get done in your role this week and write those down and it could be more than three And then I'm going to ask you, what are the high impact activities you can do for your personal life, right? What really helps nourish you, uh, you know, improves your well-being? What are those things that are kind of like, I really must do these in order to add into my life? And then um, I ask, you know, one or two people to share. What are your high impact activities for professional and for your personal? And I think that we'll notice uh, if no one wants to share. Um, as you look at your list, I'm sure it doesn't include 
looking at your phone 150 times a day, right? Spending hours uh, on email, right? The, I'm sure those high impact activities um, are a little bit more strategic. So I'd love to hear from you all what those look like. Yeah. I'll kick it off. Uh, so prospecting is an important part of my day and just making it more important. So that'll be one business related. One uh, personal related would be to make five personal calls a day, just to let people that are important to me know that uh, I care. And I pulled my Achilles tendon, so getting that back into shape so I can get to squash. So that'll be my three. Nice. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing. And yeah, all important, right? Anybody else? Okay. So um, we don't have a ton of time for this, but I would encourage you after this call, um, if you do go into your phone and into your settings and you scroll down to the second uh, group here, you'll see something called screen time. If you click on that, you can actually see how many hours a day you're on your phone, how many times you pick up your phone, uh, what you're doing when you're on your phone, and it will start to bring more awareness to how we are on autopilot and we're addicted, whether it be through you know, the stress response, the dopamine addiction that we talked about, where we're just constantly checking emails or we're sucked into social media or text messages, what have you. Um, and when we look at what you see in screen time versus what some of these high impact activities are, you'll see to realize maybe uh, I, I am mindlessly using my technology rather than mindfully using it and start to create some changes throughout the day. And so what I suggest as the routine for a mindful seller is that every morning um, when you wake up, you do your 10 minute board meeting or sit practice. I call it a board meeting. Um, every morning I do them, I sit there and I do my 10 minute meditation practice that you just learned. Then you write down your three daily deltas for the day. And what I suggest is that you actually do the first high impact activity before you check your phone or your email or do anything else. Get that first big one out of the way. And what you will notice is that you might in your head before you get started on it go, oh God, this thing's going to take me two, three hours. But when you actually don't have your phone out, you don't have any distractions, you are in a focused state, you're usually able to knock out that first big daily delta uh, in half the time that you thought. But you're gonna do that first daily delta. Then you can go ahead, check the phone, check the email, see if you need to reprioritize your other daily deltas. And if you do and you need to change your daily deltas, that is completely fine. The goal here is not to stick so hard to something uh, that, it's, that it actually doesn't really serve you in any way. The goal here is for us to practice mindfulness, which means that we choose where we put our attention. We choose what activities that we're going to do. Then go ahead and schedule those daily deltas into the day, block them out, make sure that they are free of distractions. That might mean removing the phone away from you and you know, setting a timer on it and moving it into the other room. It might mean going into your email and turning off that pop-up notification. Whatever you find is a kind of trigger or distraction for you, start to mindfully choose not to use them. And so by implementing simply these, these three things, you will notice a huge improvement on your day. Because as we talked about from a neurological perspective, we are not good at multitasking. In fact, we don't do it. What we do do really well is when we activate the neocortex. And so when we do our strength training, right, for the neocortex, and then we actually take mindfulness out of our practice and we live it, through how we prioritize what we do during the day, we really start to notice a difference, not only in our performance, because we're not cycling on those low priority items, and instead we're focused on really the big nuggets that move us forward. In addition, when we look at the stress response in the body, we decrease that. And so from a well being perspective, you will find that you feel much better after a mindful selling day versus the chaotic 
traditional sales role. And so really what we look at are, you know, going from uh, multitasking to reducing our sales cycle. We go from being really stressed out to a trusted advisor who actually mindfully listens and focuses on our client's needs. We go from being aggressive and in that reptilian brain to one of collaboration, right? Working with our coworkers and our clients. And we go from being anxious and burned out to a consistent performer, one who is able to weather the uncertainty. If you'd like to learn more from a science perspective, there are thousands of studies out there and I'm happy to send them to you. But it's been my absolute pleasure uh, to work with you guys over the past hour here and really talking about how mindfulness can be a tool for performance and well-being um, and how you can become a mindful seller. So open to any questions, comments, or feedback. It's, it's great. It's the getting into practice. Um, and I love the idea of dealing with the first, um, first item before you get into anything. Um, it, uh, I, I, I see myself, uh, going in and, and yeah, I could see if that was just one thing I took on, uh, from this, there could be a, a drastic improvement in, um, execution on stuff. Did you make a plan for tomorrow to practice? It's on my calendar. Yeah, I think it's uh, great, uh, great information, uh, especially uh, taking 10 minutes to count up and then count down, you know, just kind of, you know, bring myself to the present moment. So definitely eye opening, definitely mindful. And, you know, especially it's also the part about, you know, the phone being a huge distraction throughout the day. So just putting that thing away for a while would be uh, pay big dividends. So pretty good. Thank you. What anybody can do is to uh, just have, have like many, many breaks during the day. And um, what, what you can do is you don't even have to close your eyes. You, you just say, as you breathe in, you say, I'm aware of my body. And as you breathe out, you say, I'm letting go of all my tensions. 15 seconds and it already changes something in your brain. Right, Alexis? Yeah, it sure does. And, and that's one thing I work with my clients on is making sure that there are performance breaks throughout the day. Because right. again, it's one thing if you're practicing for 10 minutes in the morning, but if you're like a crazy jerk all day long, <laughs> that's not, that's not going right. to help anybody. Right. So if you need to take um, what I call, call it as a three by three practice. And so three times a day, taking three minutes, whether it's closing your eyes or not, um, that helps deregulate the nervous system, helps activate that neocortex, and helps us get back to the present moment. So we can start looking at things that are in front of us from a realistic point of view, rather than the one that has uh, the limbic system in high gear, um, fueled by the adrenaline and cortisol. Got it. Yeah, if I, and if I could just also add everybody, once you get into the habit, it's a really good discipline before you go into any major client or customer interaction that you take three to five minutes to settle yourself and then there are affirmations or sayings you can give or say that actually put you in a mind where there's more of a unity with the client versus a separateness which is really the biggest problem in selling is you know they don't trust you and there's this schism and if you can create in your own sense or your way, own way of being in the meeting, it, it reduces those boundaries or eliminates those boundaries. So there's a really nice interaction with the client. And that's where what Alexis was saying, you get more stra strategic, it's more collaborative, uh, you get, you know, uh, stickier clients. It's, it's a good habit to get into once you get your practice settled. Yeah, I, I think it's really important to be available to the client um, and and get out of the next, 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 next mode of the brain to the now mode of the brain where you're re really receptive. And um, I think one another ma mantra that I, um, I like to use is to allow the customer to express himself or, or herself. Uh, there are three Fs, fully, frankly and freely. So if you go in with a mindset and say, 
I want to fully understand that person. I want to fully understand that pro problem uh, or the pain point. And uh, I want them to empower themselves to be frank and, and authentic. So I have to be authentic. And freely is that you don't coerce, you don't manipulate, you don't say, well, what about this, what about that? You just allow people to happen. And if you get into that, that mindset with that m mantra in that moment, uh, you're gonna have a great conversation. And, and I know um, Uma is doing the same thing. Uma, what, uh, what, what could you add to this, what we already discussed here? Uh, I hate exercising. So every morning when I do it, I have Netflix on, watching something. So I was watching the uh, Michael Jordan documentary, uh, The Last Dance. And there were uh, a couple of things on that first episode that were meaningful. Uh, number one uh, was it was Charles Barkley looking at, talking about Michael Jordan when he first came onto the scene. And he was saying, you know, the guy moved amazingly, had speed. But what he really noticed was that Michael Jordan was a master of the fundamentals. And that was so critical to being successful. We often think that we need to be super sophisticated. And the thing that Alexis showed us is is simple, just doing that will give you massive benefit. And I think uh, one of the things they say, the difference between somebody that makes a black belt in any martial art and one that uh, doesn't is the one that masters the basics and gets really good at it, accelerate really quickly. The ones that want to learn new things all the time don't. So we already know what to do. Let's just uh, figure out what are the most important things and just do them. Well, I want to thank Alexis for that wonderful presentation.